great honor to introduce Father Angelo Geiger from the Fire of the Immaculate, who is at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas in Rome, and he's still getting over his jet lag from just arriving here. He's going to address in the Councils of the Immaculate, Father Peter Damien Felmer's contribution to the renewal of Franciscan Immaculatism. And then uh, we'll let Father Peter respond to that. And what I have prepared is a, uh, uh, and I, I stress, it's a, a short summary of key points, uh, not a long summary, but key points uh, that will help us to be uh, uh, closing remarks, okay? So we can stay on time. So, Father Angelo. Thanks. Um, when Jared invited me to speak, I, I knew exactly what I want to talk about immediately because uh, 30 years ago when I was looking for my vocation, I was a member of the Knights of the Immaculata and I knew that I had my vocation through Our Lady and that I wanted to live the consecration to Our Lady as my vocation, but I didn't know really about the Franciscan order. I was going in a completely different direction and then I got, I got sort of sidetracked to the Franciscans uh, and I'll, I'll try to keep this short. What happened was that Father James McCurry gave me a copy of uh, Father Peter's Mary and the Franciscan Tradition. I had no idea who he was, but Father James said you had to read this, and that was it. I was, I was done for, and I, I ended up in the Franciscan order, and I, I went to Rome. I met Father Peter at Casa Colby, which is where St. Maximilian founded the MI, and where Father Peter uh, was editing the uh, um, Milis Immaculate, which was the scholarly journal that St. Maximilian founded. And, uh, and from there, you know, it's been a, a long road, but Father Peter has been my, my spiritual director, spiritual father, and, and a very close friend for all these years. And so here I am, and I'm very grateful to be here. So I want to begin with a quote that struck me back then 30 years ago and has, has stayed with me ever since then. And this is from that, that article that Father James gave me. It is not so much a question of what place Mary has in our lives as what place we occupy in hers mm -hmm. that is the starting point of any discussion. This has to do with St. Maximilian's uh, uh, ideas about the Franciscan order and the way the Franciscan order should should consider the heritage that St. Maximilian Kolbe has left it. Only when the correct starting point from which to begin any study of the distinctive relations between Mary and our order has been clearly identified do we find ourselves in a position to assess the claims and implications of the militia movement within the order. In this way, Father Peter Damien Fellner has formulated the importance of the heritage of St. Maximilian Kolbe which he has left to the Franciscan order. The question is not, what is the place of the Immaculate in the plans of the order, but where does the order fit into the plans of the Immaculate? For Father Peter, this has been a burning question. Indeed, what is the order's place in the councils of the Immaculate? And what do we need to do to execute her plans? In this presentation, I hope to give you a sense of the enormous contribution that Father Peter has made to providing an answer. In a letter of 1933 to the clerics of the order, St. Maximilian Kolbe proposed the cause of the Immaculate as the golden thread of Franciscan history running continuously throughout, from the beginning of the foundation of the order by St. Francis to the present day with the promotion of the spirituality of total consecration to the Immaculate. The standard division of Franciscan history posits two periods. The first, from the foundation of the order in 1209 to its jurid juridical division in 1517, and the second, from 1517 to the present. Because of the central date of 1517, the point of view of this historical account is the controversy in the order concerning the observance of poverty, which was ultimately resolved by the juridical division of the order. St. Maximilian, however, saw things very differently. Instead of focusing on what has traditionally divided Franciscans, he emphasized on what united them, namely the cause of the Immaculate. This is the golden thread. Hence, he saw two phases or pages in Franciscan history. The first page begins with the foundation of the order at the little church dedicated to Our Lady of the Angels and extends to the proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception 
1854 by, by Pope Pius IX. It is characterized by the order's defense of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception and epitomized by the teaching of Blessed John Duns Scotus. The second page begins with the dogma in 1854 when this truth about Our Lady, which is of the highest certitude, becomes a pattern for rebuilding the church. Hence, in the second phase, the Franciscan history, uh, the, in the second phase of Franciscan history, the cause of the Immaculate takes the form of the incorporation of the dogma into the life of the church through total consecration to the Immaculate. Thus, if St. Maximilian's claims are true, then Father Peter's formulation of the question about the relationship between the Immaculate and the Order is the correct one. The question is not where does Our Lady fit into our plans, but where do we fit into hers? Father Peter's point of departure consists in the presuppositions of the Franciscan way of doing theology. According to St. Bonaventure, thinking about divine things begins with the ascent of faith, proceeds forward by rational approval, and is consummated by means of apprehension through charity. In other words, mystical theology is above the symbolic or speculative modes of theology. This is the reason St. Bonaventure believed that the life of St. Francis could be used as a theological source. He saw the stigmatized St. Francis as an eschatological sign given by God. Father Peter sees the Marian martyr of Auschwitz also as an eschatological sign in this modern age especially in respect to the Franciscan order and its vocation to rebuild the church. And I quote, If the miracle of the stigmatization of St. Francis reveals the depth of his love for the crucified and the degree of conformity of his heart to that of Jesus, then the miracle of the martyrdom of St. Maximilian reveals the way to the attainment of that ultimate objective for which St. Francis was inspired to found the order. In this, Father Peter merely presupposes that both St. Francis and St. Maximilian had an enlightened point of view. Essentially, Father Peter's position, which he has cogently defended for many years, is that St. Maximilian both formulated the question correctly and gave an answer that is theologically rigorous. That is, it's consistent with the faith, confirmed by rational discourse, and the fruit of a deep contemplative life. Thus, between the late 60s and the late 90s, Father Peter wrote a approximately 20 articles on the subject of the order in the Councils of the Immaculate for various journals such as Michelania Francescana and Miles Immaculate, the latter founded by the saint himself and edited by Father Peter between 1983 and 1989. The context of this endeavor was the post-conciliar implementation of the renewal of religious life, which had not proven itself to be uniformly successful. But Father Peter rightly viewed St. Maximilian as the apostle of our difficult age and a true son of St. Francis, whose mission was to rebuild the church in a moment of crisis. It was in this context that Father Peter saw and continues to see St. Maximilian as an eschatological sign. Further, St. Father Peter's insight was particularly pertin pertinent in respect to shifting ecclesial models which pitted our Lady's place in the church, either Christotypical or Ecclesiotypical, against each other. St. Maximilian believed that Our Lady as Immaculate Conception is a blueprint for the rebuilding of the church and did so because this pattern was traceable to St. Francis. And, and I'll, I'll move on so we, we save a little time. Um, I want to talk about uh, St. Maximilian's, the way he implemented his view of Franciscan history. In a prophetic manner, St. Maximilian addressed the problems of modernity with what he believed was the antidote for our times, namely the Immaculate Conception. Through prayer and reflection, St. Maximilian concluded that the key to St. Francis' ecclesial vocation was precisely to be found in she who he understood to be the mistress of history, because the history of the order, like that of the church, itself was locked in a struggle between the ancient serpent and the new Eve. In seeking to maintain a strict observance of the Franciscan rule, St. Maximilian was actually situating the order in the councils of the Immaculate in respect to the reform of the church. Thus, in Father Peter's view, the fundamental reason why St. Maximilian resisted all attempts to level the observance of the rule of St. Francis at Neopokalanov was to secure it 
as the property of the Immaculate and had nothing to do, and I'm quoting here Father Peter, with divisive or sectarian practices or with pragmatic considerations. There was nothing of the sanctimonious about it, for the discipline observed was not an end in itself, but a means to an end, in this case, ever closer union with an ever more zealous service of her who is the zenith of humility and simplicity, the Immaculate. St. Maximilian understood the Immaculate to be the mystery, mistress of history and of the order. This was the truth that he was defending as he also defended the traditional observances of the order. According to Father Peter, this is because the form of life given to St. Francis is both Marian and Petrine that is rooted in the evangelical poverty of Christ and his Holy Mother and characterized by, the, by a committed ecclesiality meaning that the friars as individuals and their corporate identity and in their corporate identity are to be subject and submissive to the Holy Roman Church. These two aspects, Marian and Petrine, cannot be separated. <coughs> By entrusting the order to the, uh, to the Immaculate as advocate, St. Francis was also choosing the Church. In fact, there, there were a number of evangelical reform movements in the 13th century, as you all know, and many of them, like the Joachists, were characterized by a profound anti-ecclesial spirit. Father Peter points out that by instituting a form of life which is in which both priests and brothers have a true common life, and yet the structure of authority is hierarchical, that is, clerical, St. Francis was choosing as the form of life for his order, the Church herself. To put it as Father Peter does in his doctoral thesis on charity and the ecclesiology of St. Bonaventure, authority in the church is to be exercised in the service of communion and not the other way around. And in an essay on the Catholicity of St. Francis, Father Peter writes, for the, and I quote, for the first time, in a sense, a religious founder consciously and deliberately embraced an ecclesiology as the cornerstone of his form of observing the gospel. Thus, with this Marian ecclesial form of life in mind, St. Maximilian effectively began a renewal of the Fra Franciscan conventional way of life by, um, by means of unlimited consecration to the Immaculate, and in so doing, reestablished the great tradition of the large friaries, like that of the Sacred Convent in Assisi and the Magna Domus in Paris. In the former, the life of prayer and work was organized around the presence of the relics of St. Francis, and in the latter, the great Franciscan theological tradition was developed by men like St. Bonaventure and Scotus, and of course, Scotus defended the dogma of the Immaculate Conception at Paris. In other words, according to Father Peter, in the city of the Immaculate, in Neopokolanov, the friars were committed to the vita perfecta communis, the perfect common life after the example of St. Francis, as well as to the study of theology in the light of the Immaculate and the execution of a large apostolate carried out in such a way as not to quench the spirit of prayer and devotion. Father Peter has also shown that according to St. Maximilian's formula, we see that conventual life does not have to be a compromise with the life of prayer and poverty. Rather, when the life of the friars is considered in the councils of the Immaculate, it becomes a means that is, conventional life becomes a means for the renewal both of the order and the church. In this context, St. Maximilian wished to uh, establish an academy to study the mystery of the Immaculate. In particular, the basis for his claim that the Immaculatist tradition of the order begins with St. Francis. The existence of a fully formed institutional academy is a desire of the saint yet to be realized. Nevertheless, it was in view of a first step towards this goal that Father Peter founded and continues to edit the books of the Academy of the Immaculate. That was the idea. Beyond this, it is fair to say that no one, no, literally no one has done more to fulfill St. Maximilian's wish in this regard than Father Peter. In fact, in his essays, such as the one I, the one I first read, Mary and the Franciscan Tradition, The Virgin Made Church, um, Father Peter has done the lion's share 
of the foundational work that St. Maximilian saw as so necessary to the order's correspondence to the councils of the Immaculate. Among the lines of thought developed by Father Peter in these essays are the following. This is just a brief summary of many converging lines of thought which Father Peter has developed at length. First, uh, early Franciscan sources corroborate St. Maximilian's claim that St. Francis, and I quote P Father Peter here, not implicitly alone, but also formally and explicitly knew, honored, and served the Immaculate, end quote. Basing himself on recent research, but going well beyond it, Father Peter shows that the authoritative early biographies of St. Francis and his writings give evidence of the Immaculatist orientation of the Seraphic founder. Even if he did not explicitly use the title of Immaculate Conception, his appellate his Virgin Made Church and Spouse of the Holy Spirit both express the characteristic nature of his Marian devotion and qualify it as ecclesial and immaculatist. In fact, St. Maximilian's <coughs> quintessential contribution to the understanding of the Immaculate Conception is precisely access to the concept of Spouse of the Holy Spirit, which he took from St. Francis. Secondly, Father Peter shows that St. Maximilian did not formulate his perspective on the history of the order whole cloth posterior to the foundation of Neopokalanov, nor did he come to a theory about the origins of the Immaculatist tradition of the order in light of his own commitment to Marian consecration, but rather the other way around. In fact, he was studying the, little known, uh, the, the work of a little-known uh, Umbrian friar by the na name of Filippo Fili Rossi during his years of formation in Rome, who articulated precisely this position. And this, uh, Father Peter writes here, um, before St. Maximilian, scare quotes, wrote the first page as a prelude to the second, he had already read that page elsewhere, explained in such detail from a Marian perspective that one may justly say it was the first page which initially suggested to him the second, not the second to originate a Marian Immaculatist reading of the first as the justification for making the cause of the Immaculate the central concern of the Franciscan order. Thirdly, Father Peter highlights the importance of a, of a Franciscan Marian geography of faith by which he utilizes an insight expressed by St. John Paul II in his encyclical Redemptoris Mater, namely, that the historical interventions of the Immaculate in a specific place where her maternal presence is exercised and felt in a special way complements and reinforces the perception of the objective and supernatural character of the mystery celebrated there. Thus, corresponding to the two pages of Franciscan history are two historical centers. First is the Portiuncula, the little church dedicated to Our Lady of, of the Angels, where St. Francis chose to found the order and where he uh, laid himself down to die because of his great love for the woman of the Apocalypse. The second is Neopokalanov, where the cause of the Immaculate is executed in the mode of the incorporation of the dogma into the life of the Church. In both places, there is a special active and exemplary presence of Our Lady and there is a, the perfect common life patterned on the gospel whose form is the church and whose purpose is ecclesial renewal. A most interesting feature of Father Peter Damien's thought on this subject is its evolution, that is the evolution of his thought. It began in the late 70s with a desire to see a balance achieved within the conventuals in regard to the implementation of the conciliar reforms of religious life, and it developed into an ever more explicit, explicit conclusion that the Colbian heritage was both the solution to the renewal of Franciscan religious life in obedience to the Council and the recovery of the greatest features of the conventual tradition. This work culminated in 1986 with the presentation of a paper to the extraordinary general chapter of the conventuals on the Colbian heritage entitled the impact of the Colbian heritage on the relaunching of the influence of, Amer of Mary Immaculate in the spirituality of the order. Father Peter Damien's insights proved to be prophetic. 
In several general audiences of 2010, Pope Emeritus Benedict place, placed the early Joachimite controversy within the order in parallel with the post-Vatican II crisis of implementation and proposed St. Bonaventure's wise and prayerful response as an answer. We can say then, between the extremes of secular worldliness and anti-ecclesial sectarianism, there is the sanctification of the intellect, according to the mode of Centuri Cum Ecclesia, which corresponds with the sapiential way of doing theology. St. Maximilian exemplified this tradition in response to the growing crisis of modernity, and Father Peter has urged this solution in and throughout our own period of ecclesial crisis. That the order should be destined to swing between the poles of secular worldliness and sectarian apocalypticism is the irony of the Franciscan phenomenon, whose mission it is to repair the church, not tear it down. But the extremes are not inevitable, especially when divine providence has provided us with the formula over and over again in saints like Bonaventure and Maximilian. St. Francis was given a vocation whose very nature was to embrace and embody an ecclesiology and an ecclesiality, as Father Peter has written. This was then the cornerstone uh, of St. Francis's form of observing the gospel, namely the church repaired according to the pattern of the Immaculate. And my conclusion, which I, I never printed out. Um, <laughs> Father Peter has asked the right question concerning uh, the relationship of the Franciscan order to the Immaculate. And in answering it, he, he does not say that, that every Franciscan community, every friary needs to be a city of the Immaculate, but that the order needs the city of the Immaculate and that it cannot afford to lose this tremendous grace. For Father Peter Damien, there is a great deal that rides on what happens to St. Maximilian's Franciscan patrimony. If I was da to dare to summarize the thought of Father Peter in this matter, I would use an insight from Joseph Ratzinger that uh, the personal figure of Mary becomes transparent, uh, becomes transparent to the personal form of the church herself. It is Our Lady that guarantees that the church is not turned into some sort of thing or abstraction. In choosing the Immaculate, St. Francis chose the Church. And in choosing the Church, St. Francis chose the Immaculate. In sum, the personal form of the Church is the Immaculate, and the form of life of the Franciscan order is the Church. In the light of St. Maximilian, and most especially in the councils of the Immaculate, the rebuilding of the Church means that the form of the Immaculate must be impressed upon the members of the Church by means of total consecration and the chosen instrument for this work is the order, especially the city of the Immaculate. But in the end, it is not that Our Lady needs us, but that we need her. And the realization of this truth is something for which we will forever be grateful to uh, Father Peter. And I, I just want to say at the end that there are, there are many friars throughout the, uh, the world, in Italy, America, the Philippines, Africa, who look to Father Peter for, for guidance and um, for counsel to make it through all the twists and turns of Franciscan history. Thank you. Father Peter? Well, it certainly summarizes my thinking on the matter over a long, fairly long period of time, almost 40 years now, and with a certain preparation for that. In the dissertation, I chose to write for the doctorate in theology and in the, uh, the Seraphicum, the theological faculty of St. Bonaventure of uh, ancient, uh, ancient times continue today. So as uh, I stand for what I said, I, I don't know what forms these things should take already. There's a human element. Controversy uh, arises. But basically, St. Maximilian is right. Uh, the uh, adoption of uh, the uh, stress on the Marian in, in Franciscan life is not a question of either Marian or Franci uh, Franciscan. As in, but uh, that uh, our, Lord, our Lord intends by this arrangement that uh, there should be a constant stress on the unity of all, 
or who profess the rule of St. Uh, St. Francis, not on separate, separate separation, and should be able to find solutions for the difficulties that, are, 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 uh, that, that arise. Anyway, uh, everything's not perfect, uh, perfect yet, but I think there's a basis for hoping that it will continue, as it were, to, to, uh, to, to, to survive. Certainly the, the desires of Our Lady will continue to be realized in one way or, or another, whether I manage to be a part of that realization. That's another. That's a separate uh, question. I hope so. Although I don't want to say I have the answers for all the problem uh, for the problems, but I would hope that others others would have the same the same humble rec recognition that uh, that we have to try to understand what is what is going on and what are the things of value that must be pres preserved. Unfortunately today, when you say things of value, people think of dollar bills or and gold belts, uh, locks, I mean, stresses on the material and the, uh, the secular. That is the source of the greatest difficulty, not because uh, life is defined by St. Francis or St. Maximilian, it's all that impossible. That leads, of course, as a true a true theological understanding shapes our minds and our hearts to make prudent judgments, not to imagine that there's an absolute material example to be always followed in all instances, as well as stress, overstress on the externalism, the ritualism of uh, certain sectarian groups, and the opposite extreme of simply saying, well, I'm going to do what I please, use the order as it were for my own uh, profit, whatever that is. That, uh, that that could be. I once was in, heard the uh, remark of a Bulgarian friar. I was sitting next to him at table in Casa Casa Colby, and a certain friar came in. He was working on his tenth doctorate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this Bulgarian friar. Well, he wasn't a uh, we were prophet saints, but he was at least an honest man. He said, "Look at so and so." Are you, all those doctorates that he doesn't know how to tie the shoelace. <laughs> uh, anyway, that was a good presentation summary. If I thought I never could have done it myself, <laughs> it would have ended in a, uh, a ten, ten week ongoing ongoing meeting to discuss ideas. Do we have time for a question, or is it? Uh, we're really running late, but to want to make time, a can, okay. Can, we should wrap it up, and then maybe it'll be a discussion over over lunch. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Okay. Um, I've got sandals on, so I don't have to tie my shoes. <laughs> 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 Thank you very, very, very much. <laughs>